will hopefully help you figure out what you want to do in life or reconnect you to what you love doing. Each show has a guest who is doing what they want to do, whether it's in their career or in addition to their regular job. Most importantly, we want to help you realize that no matter your age, you too can do what you want to do if you have the will to do it. Now here's your host, Leonard Kaplan. Hi, and welcome to another edition of What Do You Want to Do? On today's show, I have part two of my interview with Joe Doulet as he wraps up his discussion on beekeeping. If you recall, last week we got into the beekeeping after Joe discussed his career as a video teacher at Swampscott High School. Also, on this week, after the beekeeping wrap-up, we talk about Joe's passion for screenwriting, a growing passion that he adopted when he took a screenwriting course with the writer of Cocoon, of all people. So this is a very interesting discussion. Stay with us, and we'll be right back. So there's so many jobs in the hive, and everyone's doing their part to to make it work. So the little I know is that uh, bees pollinate flowers, and they pollinate vegetables. And I have a garden, and I have a lot of corn, and I know that they will pollinate the, the tassels, and the tassels will fall into the husk of the corn. And that's what makes the kernels mature. Yeah, it's the going from like one to the other. And they, yeah. you know, as they land here, they inadvertently pick up and then they land here and they kind of pollinate. So it's like, it's the traveling from thing to thing, which aids the pollination. So how in danger is the bee population? And what will that mean if something happens to it, to our food supply, our vegetable and flower supply? You, I mean, the pollinators are essential for, for fruits and vegetables and these things to kind of grow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some instances where you can hand pollinate, but that's, that's a lot of work. Um, honeybees are not native. They're not native to this country. So honeybees aid in pollination, but they're not the native pollinators. Mm -hmm. But like in this area, bumblebees are native. Mm -hmm. um you know monarch butterflies kind of come and they do some pollination as well there's a I lot of native pollinators around here hmm. um you know they're trying to travel in through well they're born here but they're you know they're they're pollinators so they'll they'll grow on milkweed and they'll you know they'll come out and they'll they'll pollinate before they go do their migration um so i mean i i don't know what the answer is if there were no honeybees i don't know enough about what i know there are crops that depend on honeybees but they're not native so what commercial crops that depend on honeybees as pollinators do is they hire bee, they hire companies that have bees on trucks mm -hmm. and they drive the honeybees to the fields. And then the bee, they'll let the bees out and the bees pollinate that field. I think, I think the almond, I'm not totally sure, but I think that the almond industry hires pollinating, you know, honeybees to come and, set up their hives and they go out and they pollinate and then they come back and for however long they need them, they're there. And then at night they're all in. So they, you know, close them all up and then they'll go drive somewhere else and they'll do it. So the thing about honeybees is that you can, you can, you know, queens are raised and there are companies, there are industries, there are businesses that develop queens and develop colonies. And so the, what's difficult with the industry now is that, you know, whatever the numbers were, I'm just going to make it up, but say 75 to 80% of the hives would overwinter. So the next, the next season you've got your colonies, but now, you know, it's like 50% or less overwinter because of all the different, you know, dangers to, to honeybees now doing the pesticides and, right. and mites and that type of stuff. So there's a, there's a larger cost because you don't have the same, you know, kind of inventory the next year, you have to start all over again with new colonies. So it definitely will impact it. But the native pollinators are, you know, in the end, more the problem. And if, if you if you're using a lot of pesticides and herbicides on your gardens, and you're killing all your native pollinators, mm. you know, then your all your native plants and all your native species start to die. My last bee question. Sure. Yeah, is the Africanized bees that everybody talks about invading this country, I guess that's yeah. already already happened right and 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 what did what was the effect of that the way that i understand this is that 
the African strain of the honeybee, there's like the ones that I know is there was an African strain, there's a Russian strain, there's an Italian strain. Mm -hmm. And the African strain of honeybees is notoriously more aggressive. Mm -hmm. There's some benefits to it because it can survive because of its aggressive nature, mm -hmm. but it's become, it's more of an aggressor and will, you know, m more likely sting you unprovoked. That's kind of what I know without doing too much research about it. Mm -hmm. And so I guess there has been like a, I guess there's been like a, an actual development of these bees that have kind of come up from the South um, that aren't cultivated, but are actually kind of like living in the wild. Um, what that means to like, you know, us up here in the Northeast, I don't know actually how that's going to impact. I don't know if there's a competition between an mm. African strain of, bee, of bees and an Italian strain of bees. I don't actually know. The prediction was in the news media that they would destroy all of our native species and they themselves don't produce as much honey. But maybe that's just a myth. I don't know. I don't know. I need yeah. to know more about it. Yeah. There is a there is an Asian hornet that appeared in the on the West Coast for the first time recently. Mm -hmm. And that I've heard is a disaster for honeybees. They will just mm -hmm. go in and decimate a colony uh they're huge they're like orange wow. and they're this big and they're just they are notoriously like they are trying to like when they see one they follow it they try to find the the hive and they try to destroy it because if this thing takes hold then from what i've heard it's more of a threat to the honeybee population than the african uh honeybee and they probably don't produce honey either no they're they're hornets yeah they're not yeah. even bees so how did you get involved in screenwriting? Because that's another thing that you never talked about. And I was always talking about writing in those days. I uh, I don't, I never really wanted to write a screenplay. I wrote one because a client wanted it. So I developed a, a script as part of a project I did for somebody. That was like the only screenplay. And I wrote one when I was in college because we had like Com 101 where you had to write some mm -hmm. one of everything. Um, but that was more TV. I was more a TV major than I was a film major. Sure. Um, but I get to, you know, I get to teaching and I'm like working with teenagers for, you know, six years at Cambridge, mm -hmm. 12 years at the ICA. Mm -hmm. And now I've been at, you know, Swampscott High School for seven years. So I've been working with, and they're writing scripts. These kids are writing scripts. I got a student at the high school who comes in like every day. It's like, Mr. Gillette, I wrote another script. It's like, you, you, already, you wrote one last week. <laughs> and these are like 60 minute to 90 minutes, you know, screenplays. I was like, oh my God, these guys are unbelievable. It's like really impressive and inspiring. So I'm looking, you know, to take some grad classes because as, as an educator, you take grad classes, you get yeah. more credit, you, you, yeah. know, you get more money. And I was like, I want to take something that's related to my field. That's so what I, I did. Yeah, exactly. You know. Mm -hmm. So there is this screenwriting class. And I was just like, that would be great because I don't really know how to teach my students screenwriting. Mm -hmm. Because I've never written one and I've never yeah. taken a screenwriting class. So I said, you know what, I'm going to take a screenwriting class. So turns out the professor is the guy that wrote Cocoon. Wow. From the 80s. So, you know, no he's kidding. a screenwriter. He's as he, I don't know what he's done, you know, That's great since then, but I loved the whole process. And yeah, yeah I ended up with a, an outline with like, you know, 40, 45 scenes of this, of this, of this story. Mm -hmm. um, didn't quite get to the dialogue part of it, which I was really kind of excited to get to. So I ended up enrolling as an, in, as an independent study to work with him one more semester, mm -hmm. just me and him. Wow. Um, and he was up for it. So he, we worked for another semester where he kind of helped me get through half of the dialogue. I got through about half of the dialogue of the movie. And uh, I just loved the process. And I was able to have some great conversations with my students about it because they mm -hmm. had been doing so much of this. And I also learned some interesting ways to kind of adapt that to a more, you know, more condensed mm -hmm. um, lessons, you know, unit for my students as well. Uh, and so now I've got this screenplay that I'm actually excited to finish. And then who knows, maybe produce it. I don't know. I mean, I, I, it's a long way off from producing a feature film, but um, it's exciting. And it's, it's about, it's really about my experience in this town as a father and a teacher, uh, because it follows a, a transgender student um, and relationships that that person has that kind of overlap into athletics yeah. And where, you know, a small suburban kind of, you know, mostly white town 
um, you know, has things it really needs to work on in terms of how it, it raises its kids and, and what it values. Um, now I took a screenwriting a whole program, Emerson's uh, graduate uh, courses in, in screenwriting. Yeah. And Did I, you ever write one? I wrote the Cable Club script. Oh, right, 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 right. It's right, called right. the Cable Club. You might, I think you, I read that. You may have read it. Yep. And I wasn't happy with it. And I, I started, I co-wrote a play. I co-wrote a screenplay, uh, which is called Time Scope, about a telescope that can see through time. And I co-wrote that. I didn't have the confidence. This is this is a big deal now. I didn't have the confidence that I could develop it myself. Yeah. So a good friend of mine, he's a luthier. He <clears throat> builds strings and repairs stringed instruments. We got together about once a week and we would collaborate on it and we finished it and one draft and I read it over one night by myself and I couldn't believe what I was reading because I participated in it. Every character sounded like my friend. I mean, it wasn't supposed to sound like either one of us. Shouldn't huh. have sounded like me. Yep. Shouldn't have sounded like him. Yep. It should have been the, the characters should have taken over the story right you know so that kind of put me off of screenwriting for a while and i switched to novel writing and i've been writing the same novel right now since 2012 wow it's also a science fiction thing and i i i'm hoping to finish it's turned out to be kind of like three books okay in those and are popular I, nowadays the i know <laughs> That's what I'm hoping. So I'm my goal is to finish it by December. But anyway, I just wanted to ask you, the reason I'm bringing all this stuff is not to talk about myself, but to ask you, did you, I personally felt restricted by all of the rules of screenwriting and I found novel writing very freeing. Did you experience any of that same thing? It sounds like you had a better experience than I did. Did this the professor... Tom Benedict is his name. He was awesome. He, um, you know, he said, these are tools to help you get to a story. These are the standard ways that you could develop characters and develop backstories. And mm -hmm. he said, you know, there's different moments in the movie, you know, the all is lost moment, the denouement moment, the like all that. Yeah. And he's like, this, this is the, this is a format that audiences respond to. And mm -hmm. so, if you can find if in your story you can find these moments yeah. you know these are the ways that you can bring out those moments and that that fits into that hour and a half whatever time frame mm -hmm. um but what's the story first who are the characters what right. you know what you know makes people do different things and what are the changes that people are going to go through he he was really pushing us to dig into that first and really sure. understand it, the, 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 you know, why now, why these characters and why now was his big question. That's great and, because that's, that's the key to make it a, a, a an in-depth story. Yeah. Instead so we didn't even get to the script. We didn't even get to the script in the first semester. We didn't even get to it. And that's why yeah. I was like, okay, I want to write the script now. Yeah. He's like, all right, well, let's, let's work on that. And we didn't even finish it after two semesters. Yeah. So yeah. he was much more about having the story have, you know, meaning, that then you know it's very clear what they're why they're saying what they're saying and and how it plays out over the course of the the film. That's very interesting because he sounds like a very creative person and yeah. in in Hollywood sometimes they go with you know action formula yeah. and formula and it's refreshing that somebody who has had success in Hollywood still thinks in a creative and and in innovative way. How did your students, especially that creative prolific one, react to the rules that you presented from the class you learned about act one, the inciting incident, and all those things that, that you know, that belong in, in, in certain spots in the screenplay? How did they react to the regimentary process? We, we I, it hasn't gotten to that level of specificity with them yet. Uh, what I feel like I can do is answer questions better right now. My process with my students is always very, hey, what do you want to do and how do you want to say it? And then when I feel like a rule might help them, that's when I give it to them. But I don't, my teaching style is, 
unless I'm doing like a news format that's very, very, very specific. Like if you watch some of my films, there's no, it's, it's much more freeform. Mm-hmm. I'm not like a very, because I, did, I never really did narrative filmmaking. So my approach to filmmaking is, hey, that looks really cool. And I wonder what would happen if I put that on top of this image. And then maybe someone says something, but maybe there's some music or something. So that's been my approach to filmmaking. And I bring that to my students. And I find myself not quite as able to help the students who want to be more regimented about the way they approach narrative filmmaking. Mm. I still approach those students the same way, which is like, well, you know, let's, let's experiment a little bit. But Mm. now when they have a question about, you know, what's the, what's, how do I make this, this story work better? I can say, oh, well, there's a formula here that you could use. So to me, it's just another resource that I can bring to them that now I have some experience with. Yeah. you know, having been shown that formula. That's great. I think that's perfect because it you're, you're explaining the process, but sometimes the details can can kill the desire yeah. in, in people of a certain age. if they Yeah, like storyboarding. Wrong. Like if you yeah. tell a kid they have to storyboard, you might yeah. lose half your class because I can't draw. And so I say, hey, look, people make storyboards. And if you think that would help you, then do it. But if you think that's just going to keep you from shooting your film, then just go shoot. What I got from the screenwriting experience uh, at Emerson was develop your characters until you know who the hell they are. Yeah. And and then start writing, just like yep. what he's teaching you. Yeah. And it makes the writing flow so much better. You can picture who's who and what, what they're doing and why they're doing it. Yeah, and you know what they're going to say and why they're going to yeah. say it. I was fascinated with how characters that I thought were really important ended up kind of like becoming almost like not part of the script. Like the huh. whole the whole story shifted. And he kept on saying, well, it's, you know, it sounds like this is actually this story. It sounds like it's mm-hmm. about this person now. And he was just kind of letting me flow from like importance to importance trying to narrow it down to, you know, well, why now? Who and why now? Why are we jumping into the story now? That's very, Um, very interesting. It was actually what was fascinating about it for me was also I was basing it on one of my students. She happened to be one of the students that was writing so many scripts. hmm. And so I told her, I said, hey, I'm I'm taking the screenwriting class. I I really look forward to you reading the screenplay at some point. She's like, I'd Mm -hmm. I'd love to. Hmm. And so you know, the conversation kind of went and when I finally figured out what the thing was about and I knew it was about the student, I said, well, you know, she said, hey, you know, how's your screenplay going? What's, what is the story? And I said, well, you know what? It's actually, I'm basing it on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I was, was, I was nervous. I was nervous yeah. to express this to her because I was like, well, first of all, does she want me to write a story that's kind of based on her? And, you know, second of all, I don't feel like I'm that good of a screen, a, you know, a, a screenplay writer or a screenwriter. And she's written so many at this point. So I, mm-hmm. I just confided in her. I said, look, this I'm kind of nervous to share it with you. And she was like psyched to read it and really loved it. And, you know, wow. thought that, that the characters were cool. She's, and she's like, actually, your character name was awesome. I'm actually going to steal that character name for one of my movies. Like, That's fine. You can take it. <laughs> so it's, it's been an interesting um, and really, I don't know, really exciting exchange and, and development. And, uh, I, you know, I'm really excited to, to keep developing it. Who knows? It'll get made. I'll let you know. That's great. That's great. So, I mean, that's you're echoing, again, my experience uh, with writing it itself, because a lot of my characters have elements of people that I know, right, people well, that I like, people yeah. that I hate. Right. People that are nasty, people who are liars, people who are do-gooders uh, and you know we, we meet them all in this life actually you know alcoholics anonymous why am i bringing that up a friend of mine is it was a drug and alcohol counselor and part of the recovery process for them is to write about their experience and write about problems that led them to their addictions so my process in writing for myself in addition to wanting to get it published or whatever uh it, it's cathartic if if you have a problem with somebody and you write about that situation and that person it 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 gets you through it, it it's like you're your own witness to, yeah you take control of it in a, in a, in a certain way too you, you take you you do you get it yeah. out and it's not bottled up anymore yeah and it's uh it's very uh self-medicating i would say absolutely you know? absolutely and especially when you show it to people 
that was my boss. Right. <laughs> was that based on me? No, 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 no. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a bosses I don't have anymore. Nice. <laughs> Any plans? So you, you, you might want to produce this locally. What about fundraising? and learning how to distribute things have you gotten into any of that yet no i haven't i uh i really have no idea like i think when i got to that when i get to that if i get to that point you know i have some i know some people who either have an interest and i think would have an interest in seeing this produced mm -hmm. who might have sources of funding um so in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, I know I'll talk to that person. I'll probably talk to that person. I'll probably talk to that person. Mm -hmm. um, I think the decision is, you know, would I feel like I'm the director or would I not be the director? I think like, to me, that's a more interesting decision. Like I've written this, yeah, but I don't know, know if I necessarily would want to direct it. Mm -hmm. um, and I like struggling with that because I think, you know, you've, it's a very different role. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't want to lose control of who these characters are, but at the same time, it would be really fascinating to see someone who's a seasoned director. Right. You know, but as a producer, like you'll have the power to override anything that you don't agree with. Right. Right. That whole, that whole like group kind of team, you know, some creative control, but mm -hmm. you know, more executive control. Like that is an interesting thing to me that I've, you know, I do it for the stuff that I do that's related to the town and all that, but I've never done it in a real like significant sure. way in terms of creative work. So that would, that wow. would be a fascinating process to go through. I can't wait to see it happen. I, it, it'll happen. If I know you, it'll happen. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else that we haven't touched upon that you do that I haven't known? Cause we haven't really spoken I know, in we a haven't. while. It's been a long time. It's yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, teaching, um the beekeeping now i'm writing a screenplay mm -hmm. i'm sure there are but that's probably the big ones right now all right then we get to my perennial i do archery what, now what not do you much, want but... what <laughs> I do archery. archery a little bit you of archery. Do. not oh, too much wow. but there's my I, archery target are you picturing anybody as your target no <laughs> <laughs> i would anyway i'm showing some nasty qualities here my last question is always this what advice would you give to people who have a lot of the dreams that either you have or haven't had their own dreams, but you know, a lot of people never pursue them. Even if they have a chance, they don't pursue them. And later on, you know, they'll regret it. So what would you tell these people? Well, I mean, everyone's circumstance is so different. And I think yeah. as you get older, you like, you understand the privileges that you have that allow you to go after dreams, but yeah. you also recognize that it's not always that easy for people. Well, barring, barring the obstacles in life, like, sure. you know, like if you desperate could, circumstances, sure. if you could, if they could conceivably do it, but somehow don't have the confidence or anything like that, or people have discouraged them, what would you tell them? find people who are going to motivate and bolster you so get yourself in a situation where it's a supportive environment um you know take chances that you feel you can you know ride if they are successful but also recover from if they're not so you don't want to like get a credit card and max out 50 grand for something that you're not sure is going to be, you know, that might just let you into debt. Although I know that's how some people do it, but you got to kind of, you know, take good risks, take good risks, find people that find people that you feel supported by. Um, and when there's an opportunity and it, it seems like the only thing holding you back is maybe just fear of, of, of not succeeding it's a good fear to have, but it's, it's, it's not succeeding is, is part of the process. I mean, you got to fail mm -hmm. in order to get better at stuff. You got to do stuff that you hate in order to know what you don't like so that you go more in the direction that you want. So I kind of feel like, you know, in the beginning, it's like this, yeah. and then it's like, all of a sudden it's like that kind of meter is like kind of hitting the target. There it is. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
and then you, you go towards that. But then I think along with that, don't feel like once you're aiming towards a target, you can't go in another direction. Um, all of a sudden, like, hey, you know what? I don't like this anymore. Or that looks really interesting. And I, I really want to try that. But everyone thinks that this is what I am. But I want to try something different now. So, you know, take take risks, but also, you know, take an unexpected direction when you feel like it's it's time to move. Well, Joe Dulet, thank you very much for joining me here on What Do You Want to Do? It was well worth the wait. You had a lot of great stuff and info and advice. For you're a great, you're a great there. interviewer. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That's one of my favorite things to do. I love doing it. I wish I could get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so all of you out there, thank you for joining me and join me again next time. And until then, what do you want to do? do? <laughs>